I believe this week has helped us to be reminded of that. Uh, I trust that it has, as we've heard from the missionaries, and they've told us stories of people where they live and work and serve. But we've been reminded that right here, right amongst us, are people that need the Lord, and we have opportunity to get the word to them. And maybe you're here today because somebody invited you, you heard about Southwest Baptist Church some way, somehow. Well, ultimately, it's because there's a God in heaven that loves you and sent his son to die in your place. Thankful that uh, back uh, many years ago, there were people from Southwest Baptist Church that got concerned about a family living across town and, and began to visit them, uh, new move-ins. You never know who's behind that door. You know, as we knock a door, we take a what we call a new move-in visit, meaning that they've either located here from out of town or maybe even just moved across town. That's how we... Uh, how Southwest back at that time, as Bert Harrison was pastor, how the, the brewers were contacted. And people began to visit them, and they promised, the brewers promised that they'd come, and they didn't. You ever have that happen? <laughs> and they just kept after them. Finally, they came, and through the process of that, they heard the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for them, was buried and rose again, and they both were saved. It began to grow spiritually, and then God touched their life in calling them into full-time uh, ministry and specifically to the country of Brazil. And so for over four decades, they've been laboring there in the Amazon region of Brazil and the northwest section of Brazil, kind of the wild west of Brazil. That's how I think about it every time I think about where they are, literally homesteaded and built a church there and then later built another church location and, and I just recently read about uh, Caleb, um, you know, and Joshua, as they were the two that uh, went through the wilderness and came in, and 85 years old, not that Brother Tom's uh, hitting that, but uh, uh, I, I find the same spirit in Tom and Cindy Brewer both that you hear in Caleb, if you know the story, when he said, give me that, give me this mountain, and, and at 85, he was still raring to go, well, uh, God is sending them back this September, I believe it is, and he's got on his heart and mind about doing uh, tent crusades uh, at a time when many are retiring. He's still plowing the ground and moving forward and big dreams and goals and desire to see people saved. That's ultimately what it's about, God glorified and soul saved. So, Brother Tom, we're sure glad you could be our preacher here this morning, looking forward to what God has given you to challenge us about. Come Thank on. you. Good morning. Good morning. I'll tell you what, if you had been through what we've been through this week at this missions conference at the Southwest Baptist Church, you'd want to be a missionary too. Amen. What a blessing. What a blessing. The Southwest Baptist Church was not only instrumental in changing our lives, having help, you know, bringing us the Lord Jesus Christ to completely change our lives, when we didn't even know we needed changing. We lived a normal life, you know? We had a, I had a good job, and we had a home, and we had two lovely daughters, and we did what we wanted to. We went camping and all that kind of stuff, and then God saved us. Amen. Amen. And then life really began. Amen. And then life really began. Praise the Lord. I'm so glad to get to be here today. I'd be a lot more comfortable in children's church. You know, when, I, when we were here in training, that's what Brother Harrison always called it. When we were here in training, I never preached to adults. I never taught adults. We were always back there in children's church. I didn't know you had big church in here for a long time. And we were always back there and, and, uh, in, in children's church and he said, that's the best training you can have for the mission field is children's church. And man, did he hit the nail right on the head. Amen. I'd like for you to open your Bibles with me this morning to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. We find the Great Commission in the Scripture in four different locations very clearly. First, we find it in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, which have been read and preached this week. In, March, in Mark 16, 14 through 18, 
We find it in Luke 24, 44 through 49. And then we find it right here this morning again in Acts chapter 1 in verse 8. And that's the passage that I'd like to use this morning to start. And we'll read this passage. We know that Jesus uh, showed himself alive for 40 days. Speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom, the scriptures declare that he was seen by over 500 people. As a matter of fact, at least on one occasion, he was seen by more than 500 brethren at once. And that is why when we find the Great Commission, when we find his parables, when we find, you know, people like to say, well, the Bible doesn't agree with itself. Let me tell you what, Jesus didn't say these things just one time. Jesus didn't say these things just one time. He was preaching and, and you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something. This, this message outline that I'm using today is 43 years old. <laughs> God let me preach this message when we were on deputation. And I fixed up my own message for the first furlough. And when I got in the pulpit and opened the Bible, this message came out again. The Bible doesn't change. The Word of God doesn't change. I'll tell you what, when we get into this in a minute, I'll guarantee you, my two daughters can open to the Scriptures and go right with us, you know? But that's why we have on more than one occasion, what we call his great commission. He taught it here and he taught it there and he preached to people. Acts chapter one and verse eight says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Gracious Father, we pray this morning that this thy word would go into ears and hearts of listeners. And we believe, Father, that there are people here for the first time. Perhaps, dear Lord God, those might hear for the first time your plan for world evangelization. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, for thy guidance. We pray for thy Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please sit as we begin here this morning. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. That is the instant of salvation. Amen. When we get saved, when we confess our sin, when we realize how lost we are and we call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he saves us and listen, he puts in us his Holy Spirit. And that's our guarantee of salvation. That's our guarantee we're going to go to heaven. That's our guarantee that Jesus is our Savior. And the Bible says he seals that Holy Spirit. We cannot lose that salvation after we've called upon the name of the Lord. But look here, he says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. If you're saved here today and you have received the Holy Spirit, listen, you receive all the Holy Spirit you're ever going to receive right in that instant of salvation. Amen. That's true. And he said, when we receive that Holy Spirit, we receive power. I want to ask you, do you feel powerful this morning? There's a lot of weird things going on out here of people thinking what that power might be. But right here in this verse, we find out what the power is that the Lord Jesus Christ gives us. He says, he says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Look, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. That's the power that we have the power to open our mouths and to testify of the Lord Jesus Christ since he saved me. You know, the first time I, I told somebody I was saved, it wasn't very strong. 
When I got saved, I worked as a mechanic out here in a truck shop on Reno Avenue, and, and I was one of the in crowd. I always got uh, overtime. And when it was overtime, when they closed the doors and we were finishing a job on a truck, they would bring out the bottle. And we would have some drinks and we would finish the job. After I got saved, they asked me to stay for overtime. I knew what was going to come along and I said, no, I don't need overtime. And what possessed that foreman to ask me this, I don't know. He said, what'd you do, get religion? <laughs> and my testimony was, I guess so. But praise the Lord, it must have been strong enough because they never asked me to do overtime again. <laughs> but ye shall receive power. And that power is to witness. This is the power we receive. Listen, we're talking about every saved person has the power to open their mouths. And this morning, the members of the local church, the Southwest Baptist Church, each member has the power to be a witness. Now listen to this. Oh man, this is the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me. He even tells us where to be a witness. He said both in Jerusalem, that was their hometown. That's Oklahoma City for us here. Sure. Or more or Whatever place you came from today, I'll tell you what, Southwest Baptist Church, in case you didn't know it, in case you're a visitor here today, Southwest Baptist Church is so faithful to serve the Lord, there's people that drive a long way to get here and be, be uh, congregated and serve the Lord at the Southwest Baptist Church. That's your Jerusalem. Then he says, in Judea, and Samaria, I'm going to say, to make it easy, that's like Arkansas and Texas and Kansas. And then he says, and unto the uttermost part of the world, of the earth, of the earth. That's where we live. <laughs> and every one of the missionary families today would say, that's where we live. But let me tell you something. Look what God says. He says, ye who are saved, who have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, you, ha you have the power to be witnesses, not only here in Oklahoma City, you have the power to be witnesses. In Samaria and Judea, you have the power to be witnesses to the uttermost part of the earth. That's Brazil, that's France, that's Uganda. And some of these places, they have to show me on the map I never heard of before. Isn't that something? You have the command. This is the Great Commission. You have the command to be witnesses in all those places. Now, somebody here might say, I can't do that. I have a job. I have to be at work in the morning. How am I going to go be a witness to the uttermost part of the earth? Foreign places like Texas. <laughs> I can't do that. I have a job. Well, let me tell you, God would not give us a command that he did not give us a way to do what he commanded us to do. And so today, we're going to call this God's Bible Plan and Great Commission. These are his marching orders for his local church, the Southwest Baptist Church. Turn with me to Acts 13, just a few pages over. In Acts 13, we find a local New Testament, listen, Baptist church. Now, I know it doesn't say Baptist right here. Back then, they didn't have all these weird offshoots and Protestant stuff. Right, right. And so they didn't have to write Baptist. Yeah. 
Now we put Baptist so people will know, listen, Baptist is not our denomination. Baptist is our doctrine. Baptist is our Bible doctrine. Now that, that gives us a little bit of problem sometimes in Brazil because, uh, you know, some of these offshoot stuff, they figured out, wow, people like that word Baptist and they called it the Baptist Pentecostal Church. The Seventh-day Baptist. We have all that stuff down there. Down there, we put the name Bible Baptist. That's a good thing. That's being stolen too. But we need to stay true to the Baptist doctrine. And listen, if we're going to, if we're going to, have church. We need to do exactly what this church here, that's an example for us. If we're going to be a church, we don't want to, okay, what can we do different? Okay, let's clear off this platform and, and let's have a dance and, and let's do this. No, we need to do exactly like they did in the scriptures. And so we find this local church in Acts chapter 13. Look at verse one. There were in the church that was at Antioch, certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And so this church had various men teaching and preaching. Oh, look up here on the platform, would you? There's Brother Ted. There's Pastor Gaddis. And there's Brother Ben Swinger. And there's a song leader. And there's Brother Perkle. You see, when we, when we say our church is like a local church in the New Testament, we need to have the men and their name here teaching and preaching the Word of God. And members. Let me tell you, these one, two, three, four, They've got it easy today. You ought to see all the other preachers around this place. With the bus kids. And your kids. Hey, they're back there busy. They're back there working, preaching, teaching. And that's what a local church is supposed to do. And so, it says here in verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord, that is the work of the local church, Amen. is to minister. That embraces a lot of things. That embraces a lot of work as they ministered to the Lord and fasted. I won't talk about that part today. The Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And so we have... Step one, in God's Bible plan for world evangelization, God says, I will call those who I would have to go out from the local church. I will call those and I will, and, and that's how they, it happened again last night. We went to lunch and we had a wonderful time with the church family. What a blessing. And someone at the table said, how did you choose Brazil? We didn't choose Brazil. If there had been a choice, we might have put Tahiti on the list <laughs> or Hawaii. Now, I praise the Lord. I praise the Lord because I've heard so many, I've heard so many testimonies over these uh, 50 years that we've been serving the Lord, 43 years in Brazil, and so many testimonies about, I don't know what I need to do. I don't know where God would have me to go. God wants me to, let me tell you what happened in our case. Cindy and I was sitting right back there about the middle, and a missionary was up here showing slides. He wasn't even preaching. And he was showing slides and one certain slide came there. I can see that slide in my mind's eye today. And God said, that's where I want you to be. And I praise God. He put Cindy. He put that in Cindy's heart at the same time. I didn't have to say, Cindy, we're going. And she would say, you've got to be kidding. No. We've always been. Oh, listen. We never had one doubt about where God would 
have us minister. And I praise the Lord for that because it doesn't happen that way with everybody. I pray that God would show you as clearly as he showed Cindy and I. That's step one. Okay? Verse two, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, here we have God again, God the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for missionary, mission work, for the work whereunto I have called them. And then verse three says, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Now I'm going to read that again, filling in the pronouns. There's a lot of they's and them's and theirs. And when the church members had fasted and prayed and laid their, the church Men, the men who ordained these people, when they laid their hands on these missionaries, the church sent them away. Wow. So that's number two. God uses the church to send out those he has separated and called to be missionaries. Well, that's great. You see, if you haven't been to the spotlight or whatever they call it on the, on the presentation, uh, we're going to show it one more time back in the real people's class tonight. And, and in there, it's a, it's a, it's a video and, and uh, Brother Bunswanger is uh, doing uh, some, the, uh, the uh, what do you call that? Narration. Yeah, Narration. And he said, there they built a house also, and there's a beautiful house. Well, I have a confession to make. I didn't drive all them nails. Cindy Lou didn't hold up all them boards for me to drive those nails. There's another picture there of our daughter Ferris driving nails in a different house pinning up her hair because it was getting in the way and she didn't want to miss that nail. <laughs> Hit the wrong nail. Yeah. And Penny. Yeah. And we were building a house together. This was about in 1986. But even then, we didn't drive all those nails. We hired people. We paid people to help us build our house. But when it was finished... We say, we built a house. Now listen, that's God's plan for us to work together. He says, I'm going to choose those men that are to go, and I'm going to use the local church to send them out and take care of them, and then we're going to say, we built a house. We built a church building. We won some souls. We did what God said for us to do in this commission. This is a work of the local church. He sends some and he uses some to send them. Well, in, in Acts chapter 15 and verse 3, we read that the verse says, and being brought on their way by the church. These missionaries were bought, brought on their way by the church. Now, that doesn't mean that like in India, the missionary is sitting in this big old chair and there's four people, one on each, uh, one on each pole, and they're bringing those missionaries somewhere. That's not what that means. When it says they were brought on their way by the church, that means that the church paid for some ship passage and some groceries, and some places for them to stay, and being brought on their way by the church. Romans 24, Paul wrote to the Romans, and he said, hey, I'm going to come by and let you help me out too. He said in, verse, uh, in 1524 of Romans, whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you, for I trust to be to uh, you in uh, I trust to see you in my journey. Listen and to be brought on my way thitherward by you. After we have some wonderful fellowship, if I be somewhat filled with your company, what a blessing! Oh man, we're in this together. Amen. That's what Miss Cindy likes to say. We're in this together. 
In 1 Corinthians 16, in verse 5, Paul says, Now I will come unto you, and I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. Uh, we could put in there, for we we got to come to you in Oklahoma, because we are going to pass through Oklahoma City, all right? And verse 6 says, and it may be that I will abide and stay with you for a while, maybe all winter long, that you may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. That's support. That's missionary support. That's God's plan. I think I said the other night, it's so sad to me to visit churches and see new members of Baptist churches who have been in Baptist churches their whole life, and they tell me, we had never met a missionary until we came to this church. Wow. Listen, why in the world would anybody, I'm just going to say it like this, why would anybody have church if they're not going to do what God has given us in the Scriptures to do? What a waste of time and effort and Oh, yeah, it's God's time. It's God's money that should be spent Amen. doing what God has us to do. Right. All right. I'm going to skip a whole bunch of years here, okay? These two men stayed on the field. Paul went one way. We're going to read about his way. Look at Philippians chapter 4. In Philippians chapter 4, Paul is still on the mission field. I, don't, I should figure up how many years have gone by, but I didn't do that. Paul is still on the mission field. Remember he said, whithersoever I go, whithersoever I go, Paul is in prison. He has changed mission fields. He has changed ministries. But he's not sitting in prison sucking his thumb. He's still serving the Lord. Probably, listen, Paul probably had some of the best years of his ministry after he was older and the Lord slowed him down some and he wrote for us so much of the New Testament right there in that prison cell. Isn't that something? Imagine all the souls that have been saved because God gave us the scriptures. He slowed Paul down, gave him a new ministry. You know, I've done some checking, and as far as I can tell, Paul wasn't quite as old as, as Cindy right now. Right. <laughs> We're not thinking about retiring. Some weeks back, I was walking across the back behind the pews there, and somebody, uh, it was when we first got here, and, and somebody saw me and said, oh, are you here because you're retiring? I said, no, we're not retiring. We're untiring. <laughs> and then I went home and looked in the dictionary. That's really a word. <laughs> that means kind of like resting up to go again. I have one relative who calls and always asks, are you still hanging in there? I hate that phrase. <laughs> We're not hanging in there. We're not hangers. We're attackers. We're going forward. We don't want to hang in there. I, get to, I can't even hang anywhere very long. My hands turn loose and kaplop. So we're not hangers. We're attackers. Listen, after 43 years in Brazil, listen, God has given me the gift of tongues. Well, just two, Portuguese and English. <laughs> but you know, and, and, and please, I'm not, I'm not uh, bragging, okay? But the Lord has given me the language such that sometimes uh, Brazilians don't know I'm not Brazilian. <laughs> you know, for five or 10 minutes, I'll say something stupid. <laughs> God's given me the gift of tongues. After 43 years, we know a little bit about the culture. We have some friends here today, missionaries that live about three hours south of us, the Kokenzie family. And you know what? I love it. We met them in 2012. So we've known them about 12 or 13 years. And, and let me tell you, there's always some kind of a question. Because when new missionaries come down, let me tell you, I can give them a lot of help. 
I can tell them a lot of ways they should never do things. <laughs> Don't do it this way. Don't do it that way. Okay, Paul's on the field still. And uh, in verse 10, this is a letter. The whole book of Philippians is a letter that he wrote to a supporting church from prison. Right. And, and I'm not going to read the whole letter. As a matter of fact, I need to read what I'm going to read really fast. But in, look in verse 10. In verse 10, Paul says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also uh, care, uh, careful, but you lacked opportunity. Now, over the years, over 43 years, some churches have gone through periods where they couldn't send the support they wanted to send to us. It wasn't always through COVID. We have churches who are in military towns and when everybody is deployed, guess what? It stops. And we'll get letters and say, Brother Tom and Miss Cindy, we're not going to be able to send support. And then everybody comes back and here they send again. That's well, that's what verse 10 says. Paul is saying, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord. Now at the last, your support Support has come back again. I know you always wanted to. You were careful, but you lacked opportunity. Something happened. And then in verse 11, he says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Listen, we need to learn contentment. If you will come and and, and, and see our, our, our uh, presentation. There was a time, Pastor Minute, oh, uh, mentioned that we went and homesteaded. Yeah, we got free property in this place to build a house and to build a church. And when we got there, there was not any houses to rent to live in. So Cindy and I lived in a tent. Now, don't you go say, no, poor, we love camping out. We were campers outers before we were saved. And, and let me tell you, Cindy can fry up in a frying pan some really good biscuits. <laughs> Camping out, we enjoyed that. It was some of the best years of our ministry with each other. It was a wonderful time. I better go ahead. I'll be weeping because, wow, we had a wonderful time starting that church, building a house. We didn't live in that tent very long, okay? Uh, we live in the tropical rainforest. And the first rain that came down and whoo, took everything away, we, we rented a little house that was 16 by 16 feet, uh, no electricity, no running water, and uh, it was as much fun as living in the tent. Ferris and Penny would come home for uh, holidays from their school and, and, uh, and, and oh man, we just, we just folded their bed up against the wall and put all the bicycles outside and we just had a wonderful time. It was wonderful. Paul was content, okay, in whatever state. Now he says in verse 12, I know how to be abased. That means to live humbly. We were visiting with another missionary family last night about times when the support doesn't go very far. That means when you go to the grocery store, you go with a list and you don't buy anything. It's not on there. Other times he said, uh, I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. That means you can go to the grocery store without a list and buy whatever you want to. <laughs> and Paul said, I know how to live both ways. So verse 13 now, you can see the real context, okay? A lot of people use that verse wrong. I can do anything with Christ. Yeah. He is simply saying, whatever comes down the pike, I'm ready to live that way to serve God. Right. You see, I can do all things. I can live abased and I can abound. That's the real context. But he said in verse 14, however... Notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. Communicate, if you want to go look it up in the dictionary, it means call. It means uh, uh, give. Give. You did communicate. You know what you do with a phone? You pick it up and you give somebody a call. 
Communicate, communicate means to give. We're going to see that word again in a minute. Uh, you, I'm really glad that the support came again because you took care of my affliction in verse 14. Notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. He said, you know, Philippians, and I have to say, you know, Southwest Baptist Church, when we first went out, you were the only church that supported us. We spent the first two and a half years with very little support. Pastor sent us to two or three places, and listen, we raised a little bit of extra money. But Southwest Baptist, when I said, Brother Harrison, we need a house, they sent us the money to build a house. And when I said, Brother Harrison, this old car we're driving ain't going to keep going, they sent us the money to buy a brand new vehicle. And then in that same two years, we said, we have an opportunity to start a church here, but we need a piece of property. And they sent the money to buy the property. You don't need support when you got a church like this. Well, <laughs> ah, let me tell you, what a blessing. And that's what Paul's saying here. He says, notwithstanding, you have well done that you did communicate with my affliction. He said, you Philippians know when I first went out, uh, when I first went out on this mission trip, when I departed from Macedonia in verse 15, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. Now, let me tell you about that giving and receiving, okay? Uh, when you're a new missionary, you think about the receiving part as being what the church gave. Get out to the car and see how much that support check, I mean, that love offering is. But when you've been around a long time like us, you figure out that's not talking about receiving love offerings. That's about receiving. Listen, that's about receiving from the Lord having, having given to him. This is, a, this is a godly principle. This is a Bible principle. Giving and receiving. And he says, for even in Thessalonica, when I was there, you sent once and again unto my necessity. You just kept on taking care of me. And he says, not that I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. When you and I got saved, God opened an account in heaven for us. I mentioned that Wednesday night. I used to see that account as a big account book. And it was just a list of name after name after name of people who was saved. And God erased our sins and he wrote our name in the book of life. Amen. Now, I don't have any scriptures to back this up. But I believe with all my heart, when God wrote my name in the book of life, he wrote it at the top of my very own page. And on that page of the book of life is listed what I do for him in my Christian life. I believe you have your own name at the top of your page. What's on your page? Because God, wouldn't it have been great if God had saved us like a newborn babe at the hospital and picked us up and said, I'm taking you home. Woo! And we didn't have to live in this world. Wouldn't that be something? But he left us here because he has something for us to do. He has us, he has us here to go out and do his work. I, I, really, I really need to read to you here in this same, same passage. Look at verse... Look at verse... Uh, look at verse... Philippians 4, okay, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. When you take care of the brewers and they win souls in Brazil, all those souls go into your account. Amen. We're co-workers together, okay? Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. He says, but I have all. I'm lacking nothing. And abound. I'm full, he said, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. Hey, back in this time, there was no U.S. mail. No. 
Would you like to know how Cindy and I get Brazilian money? After, would you like to know how we get Brazilian money after uh, so other supporting churches, uh, Southwest Baptist, uh, they go and they, 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 they deposit money in our bank account here? You know how we do that? We walk up to the ATM machine, stick our card in there, and Brazilian money comes out. Isn't that easy? Didn't used to be that easy. Oh, there was different ways in the old days. But in these old days, they had to choose someone from the congregation, say, would you be our messenger this year and take things to Brother Paul over there in prison? And Epaphroditus was that man they chose. And so that's why he says, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. And then he says, what was in that care package? He says, uh, he says uh, an odor of a sweet smell. Now, I gave my age away a few days ago. I said this in a church, and I said, maybe there was some brute. And after church, all these uh, people, now the old ladies said that was wonderful. They love brute. And all the young people said, what's that? That's cologne. An odor of a sweet smell? Nope, that wasn't what was in the package. That's not wasn't what was in the package. If we want to understand what that means, we have to go to the Old Testament, which I don't have time to do. But in the Old Testament, you'll find that all the offerings and sacrifices were animals. And they would, they would uh, bleed that animal so that all the blood came out. And then they would skin that animal. And then they would clean the entrails of that animal. And then they would wash the meat. And then they'd throw it up on that burning altar. Do you know what that was like? It was like driving by Outback here in a few minutes. <laughs> yeah. You see, Psalm chapter 50, God says, I don't eat the meat of bulls and of rams. And so why did God have them kill millions and millions of animals? Because when they burned it on the altar, that sweet smell went up and God would say, my children are doing exactly like I said to do. Because if they didn't do it right and they didn't skin it, that hair would stink. And roasting it with the entrails on the inside, give me a break. But when they did it right and they throwed that clean meat on the altar, when we give the faith promise, God says, my children are doing exactly what I want them to do. That's what he says. Okay. Verse 18, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, because what I've seen is very few people give to faith promise because they have a big wad left over at the end of the month. Generally, it'll be some kind of a sacrifice. What you put in your faith promise could maybe be a pair of shoes for the kids or a new dress for your wife when she needs it. And so that's why we call it a sacrifice. When we give something that we could have for ourselves that's ours and we sacrifice it, Paul said, that action goes up as a sweet smell. And then he says in verse 19, it's our last word, verse here we have kind of an oxymoron because in verse 18, we talk about sacrifice. And in verse 19, he says, but when you do that, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. What does God have that I need? Well, going right along the same lines I've been teaching, he says, mine are the cattle on a thousand hills. Anybody in here like to eat beef? I have to say hamburger in this group, you know, but in Brazil, they eat steak. Huh? And, and, and in another passage in the Old Testament, he said, mine is the silver and gold in every mine. And listen, God can push some of it over my way if he wants to. God's principle here, listen, God's principle here is if you'll take care of my need, I'll take care of your needs. 
What does God need? He needs souls to be saved from Jerusalem and Samaria and Judea and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And he has chosen to give you and I the opportunity to do that. In another place, Jesus said, if I wanted to, I could have the rocks cry out. But instead, he prefers to use us and give us the opportunity. Do you see that? Isn't that wonderful? That's what faith promise is. It's giving so that God's will might be done. And he says, when you do that, I'm going to take care of all your needs. I could never get that done before I came to know the Lord. I was always behind and everything was all dif always difficult. I'm certainly not rich now. But God takes care of all our needs. A young missionary's son said to me recently, he said, he was bothered by this. He said, you know, the only problem with being a missionary, that's what he called it a problem, is everybody just wants to pay for everything. And he, and he, he didn't feel right about it. And I said, well, here's, the, here's the way you take care of that. Here's the way you take care of that. You take care of somebody else's need. You win their soul. That's why God takes care of us. That's why he takes care of you. Not just missionaries. All of us sitting here who are involved in faith promise missions and we're a member of the Southwest Baptist Church. We're all missionaries. And God will take care of your need if you'll take care of his need. Let's stand together. Now, I'm sure, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm sure that there are people here that are not involved in faith promise missions giving. And so you understood when I said, I just never seem to have enough to take care of my own needs. And then when I put myself in God's hands, Cindy and I put ourselves in God's hands and said, dear Lord God, use us. And he said, I will. And while I'm using you, I will take care of everything you need. What a life. Gracious Father, I pray that thy word today would encourage people who have never been involved in Faith Promise Missions giving to do as Cindy and I did some 50 years ago before we ever dreamed about being called to serve you on the mission field. When we got into faith promise missions giving and you began to take care of us as we took care of thee and thy need and souls to be saved on the buses and in the children's churches. And then dear Lord God, you let us go to Brazil and be your servants. Oh dear God, we pray today that people can understand your work. This morning, while we were here, the men, and they ask all the missionaries, they ask all the missionaries, what are your prayer requests? Almost every missionary said, we're going to work in our field, but we have relatives who aren't saved. I remember one was a father-in-law and so on and so forth. Do you know the people that most try to deter us and take our attention from, from the Lord God and his work is our own family? That happens, that happens. Family, let your young people serve God. Don't come up with a reason why they shouldn't serve God. Gracious Father, as we have a verse of invitation here in number 241, Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Pastor, come and see how many today would be involved in faith promise missions, perhaps for the first time.